Good evening and welcome to this installment of the Bankhead Visiting Writers Series made possible by an endowment from the Bankhead Foundation, the Program in Creative Writing, the Department of English, and the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, thanks also to Frank Bannon and Bob Walt and the Book Arts Program for the lovely keepsakes uh, commemorating this evening's uh, reading. And thanks as well to John McGaw of the Soup Store for making the reader's books available for purchase downstairs in the lobby. Uh, the next reading in the series will be by fiction writer Lydia Davis on Thursday, fe uh, February 19th uh, in this room at 7.30 p.m. Uh, following tonight's reading, there will be a reception at my place. Uh, I'm Matt Mackey. Uh, ma uh, maps are available here as well as on the uh, book table downstairs. Um, and if you would like to receive any email reminders about upcoming readings, please add your name and email address to the list on the book table downstairs in the lobby. Uh, as I read Domestic Work and uh, Bellock's Ophelia, one thing became plainly clear. Natasha Trethewey is obsessed with photos. Now, I don't want to peg her as a photo poet, uh, because it's really not about that, but how she sees them, with a fictional eye in creating life stories about them and a poetic tongue in telling these stories. Uh, she's concerned with expressing this in between, poetry but fiction, characters caught between two cultures and races, the proud but oppressed working class, the honorable yet fallen woman, and they build together, so each book of poetry is a novel as well. Each poem stands on its own, but they build something together, maybe a new something in this reading tonight, uh, which I'm excited to hear. Please welcome Natasha Trethewey. Good evening, thank you for coming. I'm gonna start with some of those poems from Bellox Ophelia tonight. Um, and one of the things I wanted to say about it, I am obsessed with photographs, Matt is right. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I'm obsessed with them is because I'm interested in the reality behind or outside of the frame of a photograph. Not necessarily what we already know from looking at it, but what we can discover by looking at the punctums in a photograph, what uh, Roland Barthes calls punctums. One punctum in the photographs, I think, is the wallpaper that appears in the backdrops of a lot of them. And that wallpaper, uh, the famous wallpaper from Lula White's Mahogany Hall, which was one of the octoroon brothels, one of the fancier brothels on Basin Street, an octoroon house uh, that housed black women uh, who were mulatto, quadroon, or octoroon, was identified. The photographs, when people first saw them, we sort of, in our contemporary gaze, think of them as white women, and that sort of suggests the kind of passing, masking, and masquerade that goes on in these really compelling photographs. But it was indeed the wallpaper in the background that, that told Janet Malcolm and some other scholars that this, these were indeed prostitutes. And the wallpaper, which of course is another kind of covering, was the thing that suggested to them that these are prostitutes. It was Mahogany Hall's <coughs> wallpaper, which also suggested to me that these were not white women. And so I was interested in looking at all those ways that uh, things are both hidden and revealed by the photographs. So I'm going to start with uh, the first poem. And uh, the one thing I'd like to mention, because it's nice to, to bring in our early schooling um, and the kinds of research we do, is that when I first saw these photographs, I was immediately reminded of the cover of my ninth grade Hamlet text. Belloc's Ophelia, from a photograph, circa 1912. In Millet's painting, Ophelia dies face up eyes and mouth open as if caught in the gasp of her last word or breath. Flowers and reeds growing out of the pond, floating on the surface around her. The young woman who posed lay in a bath for hours, shivering, catching cold, perhaps imagining fish tangling in her hair or nibbling a dark mole raised upon her white skin. Ophelia's final gaze aims skyward, her palms curling open as if she's just said, take me. I think of her when I see Belloc's photograph 
a woman posed on a wicker divan, her hair spilling over. Around her, flowers on a pillow, on a thick carpet, even the ravages of this old photograph bloom like water lilies across her thigh. How long did she hold there this other Ophelia, nameless inmate in Storyville, naked, her nipples offered up hard with cold? The small mound of her belly, the pale hair of her pubis, these things, her body, there for the taking. But in her face, a dare. Staring into the camera, she seems to pull all movement from her slender limbs and hold it in her heavy lidded eyes. Her body limp as dead Ophelia's, her lips poised to open to speak. I imagine that Ophelia was a woman uh, born of a sharecropping family someone who would have left the Delta, uh, her home in Mississippi, traveling downriver to New Orleans to look for a different kind of work. Letter home, New Orleans, November 1910. Four weeks have passed since I left and still I must write to you of no work. I've worn down the soles and walked through the tightness of my new shoes calling upon the merchants their offices bustling. All the while I kept thinking my plain English and good writing would secure for me some modest position. Though I dress each day in my best, hands covered with the lace gloves you crocheted, no one needs a girl. How flat the word sounds and heavy. My purse thins. I spin foolishly to make an appearance of quiet industry to mask the desperation that tightens my throat. I sit watching, though I pretend not to notice the dark maids ambling by with their white charges. Do I deceive anyone? Were they to see my hands, brown as your dear face, they'd know I'm not quite what I pretend to be. I walk these streets a white woman, or so I think, until I catch the eyes of some stranger upon me and I must lower mine a negress again. There are enough things here to remind me who I am. Mules lumbering through the crowded streets send me into reverie. Their footfall, the sound of a pointer and chalk hitting the blackboard at school, only louder. Then there are women clicking their tongues in conversation, carrying their loads on their heads, their husky voices, the wash pots and irons of the laundresses call to me. Here, I thought not to do the work I once did, back bending and domestic, my schooling a gift, even those half days at picking time listening to Miss J. How I'd come to know words, the recitations I practiced to sound like her, lilting, my sentences curling up or trailing off at the ends. I read my books until I nearly broke their spines, and in the cotton field I repeated whole sections I'd learned by heart, spelling each word in my head to make a, a picture I could see as well as a weight I could feel in my mouth. So now, even as I write this and think of you at home, goodbye is the waving map of your palm, is a stone on my tongue. There's only one other poem, uh, one other voice that appears um, in the collection of epistolary and diary poems and a few photograph poems, and that's the voice of the madam that Ophelia goes to when she realizes that um, she needs employment and can't find it as a secretary or anything else in New Orleans. This is Countess P's Advice for New Girls, Storyville, 1910. Look, this is a high-class house, polished mahogany, potted ferns, rugs two inches thick. 
The mirrored parlor multiplies everything. One glass of champagne is 20. You'll see yourself a hundred times. For our customers, you must learn to be watched. Empty your thoughts. Think, if you do, only of your swelling purse. Hold still as if you sit for a painting. Catch light in the hollow of your throat. Let shadow dwell in your navel and beneath the curve of your breasts. See yourself through his eyes, your neck stretched long and slender, your back arched the awkward poses he might capture in stone. Let his gaze animate you, then move as it flatters you most. Wait to be asked to speak. Think of yourself as molten glass, expand and quiver beneath the weight of his breath. Don't pretend you don't know what I mean. Become what you must. Let him see whatever he needs. Train yourself not to look back. I know that Joel was teaching this book and um, teaching it through the lens of of history, and I like to think about things through the lens of history and also through research in ways that we can use bits of what we know and what we've learned. And I'm going to read this poem because it, it just goes along with sort of what I was reading at, this, at the time. My husband is um, completing his PhD in history, and so the books in our house, of course, range from poetry to the the different periods of history that he was reading. And there was a time while working on this book that I was reading a lot of stuff from the progressive era. And um, Ida B. Wells was one of the things that I was reading. And so um, this poem is one of her letters home. It's March 11th, March 1911. I know well the state of dread you describe and news of another lynching where you are dredges the silt of my memory. Days when my mother would snuff the lamps early, a thin blanket of whisper and hush over us. We'd hear danger even in the soft rustling of leaves. And in the fields, we'd bend lower to our work. Such things come as less and less a shock. Everywhere, there are the dead and dying, disease taking them slowly, or violence with its quick and steady hand. In the newspaper today, tragedy in New York City, a clothing factory, so many women dying in a fire. The place they worked, locked up tight, became a tomb. I live where I work. Will I die here, too? I read that some chose a last moment of flight, leaping nine stories to their deaths. Others stayed inside, perhaps to be burned clean in the fire's embrace to rise again through the flames. That's also about the triangle shirtwaist um, factory fire. I'm going to read from uh, her diary now. This is a poem in, in 10 sections, a longer poem. And uh, I imagine that she keeps the diary at the same time that she's writing the letters. So what happens is that the, st the same story gets told, but it gets told um, from two different perspectives. One, of course, is the, per the public self, uh, the self that we create for an audience in our letters, and then the, the private self, um, the uh, more contained and I think perhaps more lyrical self um, that makes up that sort of interior landscape of the psyche. Storyville Diary. One, naming, en route, October 1910. I cannot now remember the first word I learned to write. Perhaps it was my name, Ophelia, in tentative strokes, a banner slanting across my tablet at school or inside the cover of some treasured book. Leaving my home today, I feel even more the need for some new words to mark this journey, like the naming of a child, queen, lovely, hope, marking even the humblest beginnings in the shanties. My own name was a chant over the washboard, a song to guide me into sleep. Once, my mother pushed me toward a white man in our front room. Your father, she whispered, 
He's the one that named you, girl. Two, Father, February, 1911. There is but little I recall of him, how I feared his visits, though he would bring gifts, apples, candy, a toothbrush, and powder. In exchange, I must present fingernails and ears, open my mouth to show the teeth. Then I'd recite my lessons, my voice low. I would stumble over a simple word, say, lay for lie, and he would stop me there. How I wanted him to like me, think me smart, a delicate colored girl, not the wild pickaninny roaming the fields, barefoot. I search now for his face among the men I pass in the streets, fear the day a man enters my room, both customer and father. Three, Belloc, April, 1911. There comes a quiet man now to my room, Papa Belloc, his camera on his back. He wants nothing, he says, but to take me as I would arrange myself, fully clothed, a brooch at my throat, my white hat angled just so or not, the smooth map of my flesh awash in afternoon light. In my room, everything's a prop for his composition, brass spittoon in the corner, the silver mirror, brush, and comb of my toilette. I try to pose as I think he would like, shy at first, then bolder. I'm not so foolish that I don't know this photograph we make will bear the stamp of his name, not mine. Four, Blue Book, June 1911. I wear my best gown for the picture, white silk with seed pearls and ostrich feathers, my hair in a loose chignon. Behind me, Belloc's black scrim just covers the laundry, tea towels bleached and frayed, drying on the line. I look away from his lens to appear demure, to attract those guests not wanting the lewd sights of Emma Johnson's circus. Countess writes my description for the book, Violet, a fair-skinned beauty, recites poetry and soliloquies. Nightly, she performs her tableau vivant, becomes a living statue, an object of art, and I fade again into someone I'm not. Five, portrait number one, July 1911. Here I am to look casual, even frowsy, though still queen of my boudoir, a moment caught as if by accident, pictures crooked on the walls, newspaper sprawled on the dresser, a bit of pale silk spilling from a drawer, and my slip pulled below my white shoulders, decollete, black stockings, legs crossed easy as a man's, all of it contrived except for the way the flowered walls dominate the backdrop and close in on me as I pose my hand at rest on my knee, a single finger raised, arching toward the camera, a gesture before speech, before the first word comes out. Six, portrait number two, August 1911. I pose nude for this photograph, awkward, one arm folded behind my back, the other limp at my side. Seated, I raise my chin, my back so straight, I imagine the bones separating in my spine, my neck lengthening like evening shadow. When I see this plate, I try to recall what I was thinking, how not to be exposed, though naked, how to wear skin like a garment, seamless. Belloc thinks I'm right for the camera, keeps coming to my room. These plates are fragile, he says, showing me how easy it is to shatter this image of myself, how a quick scratch carves a scar across my chest. 7. Photography, October 1911. Belloc talks to me about light, shows me how to use shadow, how to fill the frame with objects, their intricate positions. I thrill to the magic of it, silver crystals like constellations of stars arranging on film. 
In the negative, the whole world reverses, my black dress turned white, my skin blackened to pitch. Inside out, I said, thinking of what I've tried to hide. I follow him now, watch him take pictures. I look at what he can see through his lens and what he cannot. Silver fish behind the walls, the yellow tint of a faded bruise, other things here, what the camera misses. Eight, disclosure, January 1912. When Belloc doesn't like a photograph, he scratches across the plate, but I know other ways to obscure a face, paint it with rouge and powder, shades lighter than skin, don a black velvet mask. I've learned to keep my face behind the camera, my lens aimed at a dream of my own making. What power I find in transforming what is real, a room flushed with light, calculated disarray. Today, I tried to capture a red bird perched on the tall hedge. As my shutter fell, he lifted in flight a vivid blur above the clutter just beyond the hedge, garbage, rats licking the insides of broken eggs. Nine, Spectrum, February 1912. No sun and the city's a dull palette of gray, weathered ships docked at the quay, rats dozing in the hull, drizzle slicking dark stones of the streets. Mornings such as these, I walk among the weary, their eyes sunken as if each body, diseased and dying, would pull itself inside, back to the shining center. In the cemetery, all the rest, their resolute bones stacked against the pull of the gulf. Here, another world teams, flies buzzing the meat stand, cockroaches crisscrossing the banquette, the curve and flex of larvae in the cisterns, and mosquitoes skimming flat water like skaters on a frozen pond. 10, self-portrait, March 1912. On the crowded street, I want to stop time, hold it captive in my dark chamber, a train's sluggish pull out of the station, passengers waving through open windows, the dull faces of those left on the platform. Once, I boarded a train. Leaving my home, I watched the red sky, the low sun glowing, an ember I could blow into flame, night falling and my past darkening behind me. Now I wait for a departure, the whistles shrill calling. The first time I tried this shot, I thought of my mother shrinking against the horizon. So distracted, I looked into a capped lens, saw only my own clear eye. I'm going to read um, five more poems, and these are newer poems that I'm working on um, for a collection called Native Guard. The Native Guards, the Louisiana Native Guards, were the one of the first um, officially sanctioned regiments of African American soldiers during the Civil War. And I really got interested in these soldiers because um, they were stationed off the coast of my hometown, which is Gulfport, Mississippi. And if you've ever been there, you know that Gulfport is sort of designed as a resort town, which is kind of odd to me because it's pretty ugly. Um, and it's lined with, you know, casinos now. Perhaps some of you gamble there. Uh, but there was a, a wonderful landscape of uh, the, the mangrove swamp there that at some point um, they decided to completely raise and dump uh, 26 miles of sand. So it's also got sort of the longest man-made beach um, with all kind of the natural uh, flora and fauna uh, destroyed. And um, the other thing about it um, is that if you, if you take a boat, and, and you can do this, you take a boat out to Ship Island during the warm months to visit the fort, Fort Massachusetts, which is out there, the National Park Service runs it. And if you don't know to ask the park ranger about this particular history of the fort, though he will tell you it was a Civil War fort, 
He will not tell you that it was manned by black soldiers, Union soldiers. He would not tell you that, um, that the soldiers who were manning it as a, as a Confederate prison were African American soldiers. So that's sort of um, one of the omissions and erasures in public memory about the Civil War and Reconstruction and Southern history. So I'm really interested in, I think I've continued to be interested in looking at what the things that we don't see, what gets left out of the public record. And um, I think that the landscape of my hometown is also a metaphor for that kind of erasure and omission, so that we have done away with what was naturally there and put something up instead. So this first poem is, is an elegy. It's called Elegy for the Native Guards. And there's an epigraph from Alan Tate's Ode to the Confederate Dead that reads, now that the salt of their blood <coughs> stiffens the saltier oblivion of the sea. We leave Gulfport at noon, gulls overhead trailing the boat, streamers, noisy fanfare all the way to Ship Island. What we see first is the fort, its roof of grass, a lee half reminder of the men who lived there a weathered monument to some of the dead. Inside we follow the ranger, hurried as we are to get to the beach. He tells of graves lost in the gulf, the island split in half when Hurricane Camille hit, shows us casemates, cannons, the store that sells souvenirs, tokens of history long buried. The daughters of the Confederacy have placed a plaque here at the fort's entrance, each Confederate soldier's name raised hard in bronze, no names carved for the Native Guards, Second Regiment, Union Men, Black Phalanx. What is monument to their legacy? All the grave markers, all the crude headstones, water lost, now fish dart among their bones, and we listen for what the waves intone. Only the fort remains, near 40 feet high, round, unfinished, half open to the sky, the elements, wind, rain, God's deliberate eye. I was mentioning this at dinner, and it's great to finally get to say this in Alabama. I've been saying it all around the country, everywhere else I read. Um, this next poem is a huzzle, and uh, it's great. I mean, you know how, you know, you, you writers, how, you know how it's great when form and content finally come together. And of course, that's the reason why a poem gets written a certain way, because it couldn't have gotten written any other way. And that's what this form did for me. Um, because I had all of these elements that I was thinking about that didn't seem to come together in any way. And I'd been reading uh, Shahed Ali's uh, Ravishing Disunities, uh, Real Huzzles in English, and, and that was really important for me. Um, I don't know if Mississippi has uh, stricken its anti-miscegenation laws from the books yet, but I know that here in um, the state of Alabama, uh, which is a state that I, I love, just as I love my home, Mississippi, um, they just voted, you know, within the last few years in the late 90s whether or not um, we should keep this law or not. And it, it, it won. I mean, people got rid of it, but only by a narrow margin. I mean, 40-some percent of percent of the state still wanted to make uh, interracial marriages, uh, you know, like my parents, illegal and thus, uh, you know, keep people like me from being born at least legitimately. Um, so anyway, I think a lot of the poems that I'm working on right now have everything to do with the nature of the, the intersections of, of history and memory and elegy and also ideas about um, home and home as the site of a kind of psychological exile. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, Miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown 
in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. Would you believe that my birthday is Confederate Memorial Day? <laughs> it's true, isn't that perfect? And, and they established Confederate Memorial Day um, in several states in 1866. April 26th of 1866, exactly 100 years before I was born. My friends call me Dixie. Um, this next poem um, is a, a pantoum, um, and it, it tries to look at the ways in which um, in terms of the public memory, stories that get told, often there are stories that don't get told unless uh, families tell them and, and keep them alive in that way. Incident. We tell the story every year, how we peered from the windows, shades drawn, though nothing really happened, the charred grass now green again. We peered from the windows, shades drawn, at the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, the charred grass still green. Then we darkened our rooms, lit the hurricane lamps. At the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, a few men gathered, white as angels in their gowns. We darkened our rooms, lit the hurricane lamps, the wicks trembling in their fonts of oil. It seemed the angels had gathered, white men in their gowns. When they were done, they left quietly. No one came. The wicks trembled all night in their fonts of oil. By morning, the flames had all dimmed. When they were done, the men left quietly. No one came. Nothing really happened. By morning, all the flames had dimmed. We tell the story every year. This is a dream poem. You see how weird my dreams are. Southern Pastoral. In the dream, I am with the fugitive poets. We're gathered for a photograph. Behind us, the skyline of Atlanta, hidden by the photographer's backdrop, a lush pasture, green, full of soft-eyed cows, lowing, a chant that sounds like no, no, Yes, I say, to the glass of bourbon I'm offered. We're lining up now. Robert Penn Warren, his voice just audible above the drone of bulldozers, telling us where to stand. Say, race, the photographer croons. I'm in blackface again when the flash freezes us. My father's white, I tell them, and rural. You don't hate the South, they ask. You don't hate it? And I'm going to finish with a, a poem that um, has an epigraph by uh, someone I just found out is associated with the University of Alabama. I had no idea. Uh, E.O. Wilson, Homo sapiens is the only species to suffer psychological exile. This is called South. I return to a stand of pines, bone-thin phalanx flanking the roadside, tangle of understory, a dialectic of dark and light, and magnolias blossoming like afterthought, each flower a surrender, white flags draped among the branches. I returned to Land's End, the swath of coast clear-cut and buried in sand, mangrove, live oak, gulf weed raised and replaced by thin palms, palmettos, the symbol of victory or defiance, over and over, marking this vanquished land. I returned to a field of cotton, hallowed ground as slave legend goes, each bowl holding the ghosts of generations, those who measured their days by the heft of sacks and lengths of rows, who sweat 
reflect the cotton plants still sewn into our clothes. I returned to a country battlefield where colored troops fought and died, Port Hudson where their bodies swelled and blackened beneath the sun, unburied until earth's green sheet pulled over them, unmarked by any headstone. Where the roads, buildings, and monuments are named to honor the Confederacy, where that old flag still hangs, I return to Mississippi, state that made a crime of me, mulatto, half-breed, native, in my native land, this place, they'll bury me. Thank you. gentlemen, I've been asked by departmental authorities to give you the following information. Just a few hours ago, university officials took poet Larissa Schworluck, that's S-Z-P-O-R-L-U-K, into custody. In fact, she's sitting right over there. Needless to say, this is quite a coup for university security. For years, officials have suspected that Schorluck is associated with a notorious force known simply as the body of work. The body of work was last seen in Schorluck's third book, The Wind, Master Cherry, The Wind, published by Alice James Books this past September. Other documented sightings have been made by such eminent contemporary poets as Brenda Hillman who chose Schwarlock's Dark Sky Question as winner of the 1997 Bernard Women Poets Prize. Schwarlock's second book, Isolato, received the Iowa Poetry Prize in 2000. How might one identify the body of work? Lola Haskins has described its typical behaviors. <laughs> Quote, possessed of a fine nervousness, these poems can't sit still. They cross and uncross their legs. They drum on the table with their red nails. They glitter and they ache. Reportedly, the body of work is as tall as vision and weighs as much as shadow. It is many armed <laughs> and quite possibly dangerous and it tends to attract a certain type of co-conspirator. One who considers poems to be experiences rather than static made objects. One who appreciates the subtle music that guides us through windy forests, moon craters, and all manner of sublime natural settings. One who does not flee at the first sign of double crossing or indeterminate terror. Known individuals who have harbored the body of work include the editors of Best American Poetry 1999 and 2001, <laughs> and the editors of Grey Wolf Press. Journals under surveillance include Meridian, Daedalus, Faultline, and the particularly roguish Black Warrior Review. <laughs> which currently features no less than three of Schwarlock's poems. The National Endowment for the Arts, long known as a loose cannon, <laughs> is also under investigation for providing Schwarlock with a poetry fellowship. And the public funds of at least two state governments have helped to sustain the body of work. Schwarlock received her MFA from the University of Virginia, and she is an assistant professor of creative writing and literature at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Ms. Schwarlock will soon take the stage. When she does, we can expect the body of work to converge upon Smith Hall. Once present, it is likely to wreak all manner of chaos with its thought-provoking considerations of fate, void, passion, hatred, fantasy, and nightmare. To prepare for this, please turn off all cellular devices. Those with pacemakers should consider leaving at this time. The Bankhead Visiting Writer Series is not responsible for long closed wounds opened by the body of work, <laughs> nor are we accountable for temporary hallucinations. Parents of small children should know that the body of work may depict Pinocchio grimly. <laughs> As for the rest of you, consider yourself warned. Ladies and gentlemen, Larissa Schwarlick. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm not meeting with you tomorrow morning, unfortunately. <laughs> I could get you back for that. <laughs> but no, thank you. That was very kind. And um, thank you for having me here. It's, um, <clears throat> it's really an honor. This is a hotbed of incredible talent. I guess you already <clears throat> know that those yeah, talents <laughs> are scattered. And um, Natasha put me in the awkward position of trying to follow her beautiful reading. So I guess I can just be weird now, huh? <laughs> a little weird and crazy, since I can't be poised. <laughs> so I just, um, I'll just give it to you. Now. <laughs> I um, had a lot of time to fuss in the airport today, and I um, fussed to the point of realizing that all my poems are the same. <laughs> no, really, but it's just awful. So I. I decided that what I would do, I wrote one poem that is not the same, and I'm not going to pretend that it's good, but the only thing that made it different was that I forced myself to um, translate the swine herd in German, <laughs> and I don't know German. <laughs> so it, it resulted um, in this unlike poem, um, I decided to call it uh, Chateauancy, which is, um, oh, there are no scientists in the room except Lynn's husband. <laughs> I, I really rely on, on just poets being in the audience. Anyway, it, it's the phenomenon that makes the little eye in tiger's eye. It's a trapped light, um, essentially, and that and the spelling of Chateau, you see the sha, you know, from French is cat. So that's how they get tiger's eye out of that, okay? So it doesn't really play in terribly much. Okay, Chateauancy. Why be born witch to just destroy witch? Coat the eyes witch with terror, do you know? I watched them fuss, witch, against the tit, witch, this very morning for a hold. Not just cats, witch, but lambs, witch, and man, witch, every heaving lung that cries for more. It's just a fact, witch, that we're all damned, witch, to fall for what is fast and rank and forked like the fact which your crystal ball, which saw itself drenched like common stone. And that means you, which, and me, which, and them, which, this entire farm awash. So cut your loss, which, let it out, which, which of us will you miss most? Which animal without whose lips your mams would rather burst than live. Not that runt witch whose tongue witch has none witch whatsoever lust for you or choice. Tell me it's not him. He won't latch on. He won't look up. He hates your guts. He does us in. We'll die of milk along with him. That's your bliss which that rat can swim. I wasn't going to read that poem because it's, um, it's so elemental. <laughs> but given the realization that otherwise I would be talking about blood and God and all that the rest of the night, <laughs> I thought I should at least start off with the air of innovation. Um, <laughs> the, um, I'll, I'll touch on uh, Dark Sky Question a little bit, although I'm trying to, trying really hard to move away. Um, this poem, I realized, is just all about breaking up with somebody, this one guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I tried to hide it in, <laughs> in all kinds of things, um, including an essay. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> Laura and Isley, no less, who um, was writing about, if I can remember correctly, about um, 
the, um, the, really the pathos of the field mouse when his or her field is being developed. And the essay left me with this just picture of mice just running really fast with, you know, just horror in their faces and, um, you know, the little fur back. And, and then I sort of realized that they lost their homes and I lost my quote unquote, quote unquote home with this person as we decided to go penniless across the country and he ended up in psychiatric care and, <laughs> and that was pretty much the end of it. So this is um, called Flight of the Mice. It was a small dream, like our dream, built on the small wish to be home. Once the home had been broken, leveled by misunderstanding, by dodging, by the loud brunt of dark, and it broke all the plans and the ferns and soft earth they had known. So they ran for the end of the grasses as you ran out of threats, your voice a torn wire fence without land to enclose, a disobeyed boundary shaking to remember where it had owned. No one sees what they'll need to survive. No one sees the dream thicken and rise like the old foundation, the pieces of life that were good, that stood the strong weather, the one with the other, us inside, that intrudes on you now as you reach what they reached, a waste as effaced as the sky, their eyes overworked with their fabulous loss, concrete as the race against time. Um, <clears throat> this poem, um, when I was a graduate student in Virginia, we had um, Mary Oliver come and do conferences with us, and I turned this poem into her. She said, so tell me about yourself. What are your real interests? <laughs> <laughs> and she tried to convince me that my poem didn't make any sense and that I should go back to running track. <laughs> so <laughs> I just thought that since I'm going to meet with four of you tomorrow morning, if I say anything remotely cruel, just get me back <laughs> by publishing it um, in my face. So this is called um, Solar Wind. It's about the breakup. <laughs> Solar Wind. I don't pray. I just walk out there where it's thin with my bow and aim. But I should have yelled. I should have changed the world. A person can die of balance, just gleam like squid and disappear. The fence around our house is soft with rain. It can't stop my arrows. It can't stop what wants to happen. The meteors I hear, power lines blowing from the mountain, or the girl somewhere who reads you, whose skin has memorized your life. Nothing stops her fingers. They swim with you at night. Leave if you're leaving. Leave plain mud. I don't know what else is on your beard. It would be mercy, God. I grow weird in the field. <clears throat> and that's <laughs> This poem I don't usually read either, but I, there was a job I really wanted at the University of Texas a few years ago that I didn't get. <laughs> and after I did my reading, the, um, the host, a member of the search committee, said, but you didn't read your erotic poems. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess this was one of them. <laughs> the grass and the sin. They are waiting for it waiting all their lives. They are question marks changing into feathers. They are lost between their legs. Desire hath no rest. When grass is blowing, oh, I get it now. <gasps> Excuse me, I'm sorry, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, okay. 
was, <laughs> that was really crude. Okay, but no, honestly, I just that just never struck me that way before. <laughs> <clears throat> when grass is blowing, it lives twice as grass and waves. When they're in love, they give themselves to prophecies and tongues, clouds that come with clear instructions, 40 days and 40 nights. There is soundness in it, soundness in her thighs, scrape, grind, they are waiting to run down. They are hot. There are brilliant colors in the sea, so deep no one sees them. Air hides even more, two of every sort. If he is not her husband, but divine, if they are found, will they be punished? With no aroma, who will know, who will know if he's divine? If Noah's water never came, who would know how bad the land had been? <clears throat> okay, so then <clears throat> what happens is I'm done breaking up and then I get married to somebody else and I have some children. And um, <laughs> that's what's going on here. <laughs> but before I could become a good wife and a good mother, I had to go and investigate is, yeah, okay. in, 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 investigate uh, my own role as daughter. So this poem is called Givers and Takers, and it's about my father in the extreme, and it uses uh, fishing, which of course we never did, um, <laughs> as the kind of the metaphor. Um, <clears throat> my father's a, a very decent person. <clears throat> Givers and takers. Father from afar, where you have touched her, you are not. Almost a gush as she opens up, famously loud, inhaling the sky and seminal dust and man-made fly. Almost a gush as you reel her out and drop her on a pile. One is a giver, another a taker, life of fire. Now your fingers, quickly skillful, chop her up. Can't they tell her from the captured, lying stiffly on a platter, torsos only, grilled and blackened. Wherever her mind is, with the gut stuff in the bucket, floating homeward without bone work. It's losing focus, kindling inward, winding down. Trees ripple through her severed fantail, aurora shadows flail each eye. Aren't you tickled, father, tackler, to find her still alive? Find her bobbing like a fraction, top by bottom, multiplied. Almost a gush as partial daughter loiters on the waist-high water, flirting, gurgling. Take me with you, I forgive you. Final shimmer, final bite. Mm. I mean, that, that's, yeah, that's really dramatic. But when you're um, kind of, when you're postpartum, <coughs> you know, nothing is too extreme. And I remember once they came for a holiday all the way from Boston, and they said hi to my children first. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm really petty when it comes down to it. And I just, like, for me, that meant, like, I was done being their daughter. I was now the receptacle for their grandchildren. <laughs> and so I ran into the house and locked myself in the bathroom. <laughs> Until my husband said, grow up, get the hell out of there. <laughs> so... Um, that I think that was really the end of my my drama. But then, then I got into this. I had this breast feeding thing going on where I thought I was supposed to really like it, and then I didn't. And then, then I got the pump, and then I liked the pump, and then, and then it was time for the you know the heated 
water of the cow, and then I started to feel bad. And so this poem came out of a lot of feelings of um, sort of guilt and frustration, and I thought that it, we could have saved everybody a lot of woe if we had just hooked my children up to a cow in the first place. <laughs> so that's kind of, well, they, you know, they would have gotten the, the feeling and anyway. So this, <laughs> this poem um, comes out of that complicated feeling. It's called um, Homogeny. <clears throat> there are light and milk and worship on us all which is why I don't mind if she's spotted. Hills are just plains that rose in disobedience. How long can you hold your anger? Blanched with latent purity, bowed back down, the way breasts ask forgiveness of the body for being supernatant, cowering when all the mouths are done. Twins are the way Love fell through me twice, so I fixed them to her udder like slow chewing fire, which is why I don't mind. Go if you're furious with women. Go and do some rising. Milk is the proof that what we disturb in turn disturbs beautifully, clearing the moon like a ruminant martyr. Okay, <clears throat> I'm a little panicky about time, but Lynn will just go when it's time, right? <laughs> Good, don't, don't let me, you know, ramble on beyond the, yeah. okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so now we'll move on to this next era, which I don't know, I guess I was sort of hiding in Pinocchio. I think I was feeling like maybe I had gotten wooden. <laughs> And so I decided to just deal with it. Um, but I realized also when I was over preparing for this reading that, um, that I have all these sort of like hanging kind of capital punishment things going on. So this is one of those. Um, well, no, not this one. This is called Fruit of Discord. And it, um, it plays a little bit off of the, you know, the mythological apple that you know Paris had to choose between the goddesses and all that and then but I tried to take the voice of the fruit um, but it has some you know a lot of hostility in it of course okay um, fruit of discord <clears throat> mine is a dry tree the sons of aliens want me they have a need we all have a need to construct a man made of grass is the grass widow's need, but she lies in the heat of the wet, tilled field, unfulfilled, rewriting her need. If heaven were bigger, if hell less a machine, are they beaming at me? Are they singing? Someone needs honey, someone else cream or foam. Another needs Helen, a raw eleven bare-chested, hurling stones. What is your need? Not me, not my worm, not to love what is worn, not to lick my sick peels, but to fuck her hard breath in the gym. Whose side are you on? If you want something quick, but need it to last, a manifest tryst, no strings attached, pick me. My hole is black. And this is um, moving right along to um, Guillotine, is a poem that was inspired by Albert Camus' um, Reflections on the Guillotine, very powerful piece of writing. And the thing, the real reason that this whole poem emerged is because I had these two lines for like three years, and I could never put them anywhere. And the only place that they finally made sense, that the first two lines of the poem, um, were with the word guillotine. So it was really interesting that I couldn't, I don't think I could have ever gotten there um, on my own from those two lines. You know, I had to wait until time pushed those things together. 
guillotine. Many friendships have been lost here. It is all sky, all white, ongoing. Faith won't save us. The date palm and the all-consuming sun runs its little errand in a skirt of shade. Who said anything about salvation? The sand diviner lisping in the burning wind, white eyes, white skin, converts white brains into explicit figments. The gag at the back of the throat, begging the throat not to scream. The head yanked up by the hair, upheld for the world to see. Is it possible intelligence still dwells there? That the grosser lips still flutter out the rhetoric of health? That the earth hangs on nothing? That between us there never was a thread? The hanging. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just have to, I mean, that's what I did. I have to do it. <laughs> this is um, Pinocchio, but I was kind of pleased to learn that um, Carlo Collodi, who's the author of the um, real version of Pinocchio, not the not Walt Disney, um, uh, he, he wrote the book in, um, in a serial, so it was, he would just do chapters. And um, apparently he was poor at the time and needed money, and he was doing it that way. And he had actually killed Pinocchio off during the hanging. Um, you know, the thieves chase them, the fox and the cat disguised in um, bags or whatever, and they hang him. And then that was it. And I guess the Italian children just went bananas. They just <laughs> like had breakdowns, and they, <laughs> they were really upset, and so they, they forced him to keep going. And um, so he did, and then, of course, most of the story ended up coming later after that. So just very interesting to know that as I was um, working on these poems. The Hanging. Sunset is long here, falling, slipping between the great oak leaves, striking the puppet like embers of metal, impossibly many, impossibly hungry, staining him red and gold, no matter how dull his skull is, hissing against his paper clothes, as if of opinion, too, that the coins in his mouth should spit right out into their murderous paws. But then it is dark at last, and the thieves who had lain under his feet slouch away, tired of waiting, of watching him die, like the tongue of a bell, mumbling, Father, if only, softer and softer, until they could hear, had they stayed in range, a third, more durable, thief's acclaim. <clears throat> the Pinocchio stuff was really hard to write because, of course, the story itself was, you know, obviously, um, you know, incredibly, I mean, a masterpiece. Of so what business did I have poking around in there? I don't know. But um, I did a couple spins I'm sort of proud of. And this is, um, well, I shouldn't say that. That sounds heavy. I'm, <laughs> I'm not proud. I'm <laughs> just, OK. Um, so this is um, called Fulfilled by Parting. And I'm dealing with, um, you know, when sort of dealing with when Geppetto and Pinocchio are trying to get out of the, the um, dogfish's mouth and they have to wait for the mouth to open. Um, and uh, presumably the dogfish does that when it's sleeping. So um, that's, but it's, well, it's, that's the setting anyway. OK, fulfilled by parting. The harlot in the desert plates herself a collar to keep her spirit low. In a time of slower swings, more expansive budding, the sudden manic flower hits the ground. Things can't help being what they are. The tallest house of cards, the most seductive armor. Puppet, are you out there? Is your incubation monstrous? Will you lose your holy flit in all that flesh? The snail begins to run like a fireball. In August, 
Not a thought about her ragged shell. The navigator, home, completely settles down, slips into the mouth she left of semi-conscious yarn. That's my, <coughs> my new erotic poem. <laughs> okay, um, so this is an interesting story, which I'm sure I'm no longer getting correct, but this is, um, um, once upon a time, they, um, they being men, um, used to put girls in bells um, as they were um, celebrating the new town. And the girls would be, I mean, I'm speaking in sort of a fairy tale way because I can't remember any of the details. <laughs> but it's true. And um, so, but they also used to like build them into foundations. Um, of buildings live too, so that their spirit would infuse the building. Uh, bizarrely enough, they would imagine in a positive way. <laughs> and so, this is about the bell, the girl who gets put in the bell. The poem is called Hippocampus, and I'm trying to work with um, the meaning of hippocampus from the Greek, which is seahorse, um, as well as the brain thing. Hippocampus. A bell is gonged, the body of a girl curled up inside it. A town grown wild, dogs sniffing skyward, gong, gong. They listen all night for the girl to fall, her stomach to growl, the foundered skirt to hop and swell, a gallows flower. Or is it a foot in a mindless gallop, snorts of delight as the gods take up the virgin offer? Or is it a weird and beautiful gargle, the love-making sound of a deep sea diver? <coughs> OK, I have a feeling it's getting late, right? It's getting like, wait, five minutes? Should I? One more, two more? Um, okay, then I'm going to try to go back to this crazy new stuff. I'm just going to do one or two then. And um, this, is, um, this is what I've had to do now because I'm, I'm, you know, everything's, I have had my children and I'm married, happily married and all that. So I had to make up this crazy story about this planet where everybody's made of stone and they don't like anything that's alive. And so this boy, stone boy, why is there grass in my there's this, no, I mean, not marijuana, it's just, um, just I mean, really, there's, oh God, that's weird. All right, um, so anyway, the thing is, is that um, he, he thinks that his mother is, like, cheating, like, that she's really maybe hiding some life forces, so he starts to pay a lot of attention to her, and he, he wants to turn her in. The poem is called Boulders. He knew she was hiding a bee. He could hear it zapping inside her, trapped in the amber nook that led to her mineral uterus. He had been born with that sound, the rain of maracas, suck of a rose, and so lived in his mind with a wax city, silver hives of see-through honey chambers crammed with princess waste and ice and would be almost crazy brushing her outer stone of which he had grown enamored like a pilot of a bomb site fingering the lever this century wants anything is that a soul okay last poem um well, okay, so he, like, his father chops off his head, and then um, he, his head falls to earth and becomes a mountain, and because they're much bigger than we are, and the <laughs> head sits there for a long, long time. Passive aggressive music. Crests breaking over his severed neck, dumped salt on his lips, and the salt formed cakes like infected sores. In time, the cakes became domes, 
and gulls set their nests in the dome umbrellas. But during the midday summer sun, even the shade there shone like Judas's eyes on the fish at supper. He never wondered where his body was. He only murmured to the gull who seemed to know him, something about his mother's pitch, the sharp injustice of its softness, and what's so important that it makes you forget, like ammonia, everything. Thank you.